I've actually studied how big societal transformation happens. Um, and when, in order to have big transitions, um, it, the theory is, the academic theory is that you need disruptions and disruptions at multiple levels. So you need the status quo to be disrupted, which is where we are right now, I think, because of the pandemic, as well as some other factors. But our day-to-day -day normal, right, has been definitely disrupted. And I think everyone can feel that. Um, then you need some macro level disruptions um, that could be the climate crisis, um, right? We're seeing more frequent and intense climate disruptions of all kinds and, and, and the implications of that. And then at the same time, you need local level, innovative niche experimentation, a grassroots activism. Um, and I see that as well. So, um, you know, I, I am um, optimistic about a, a restructuring and a transformation of, of society. I know it may seem naive uh, given what's going on, um, but I think there are enough of us who are committed and passionate and creative and innovative, and we are networked and we can be increasingly networked with each other and support each other. <laughs>
It's great to be here, Mark. Thank you it's for having me. Wonderful to have you. And um, I, I'm not going to apologize one bit for your long bio because I know I could have had it be uh, so much longer. You've been doing this for quite some time and doing amazing work. Um, just for my listeners, we uh, our paths kind of crossed digitally, virtually through the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Um, Jeff, Professor Sachs and, and many other greats uh, kind of heading that organization for the United Nations and kind of teaching around sustainability and uh, SDG Academy. And uh, I saw a, a wonderful post about your book and I've been following you in other ways and, and it was so nice that you're able to be on the show. No, it's uh, great to be here. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to jump right into it with our our first question. So because you have this long history, you have this wonderful bio, you're doing things um, in environment and climate and energy and renewables and, and um, also in, uh, you know, tons in leadership. And one thing that really resonates with me and my heart is uh, uh, Resilience Institute as well. So uh, I have a company that's called the Alohas Resilience Foundation and, and do a lot with resilience thinking. In 2019, started um, with the United Nations, a new project called Resilience Frontiers, which is the, the next step beyond the sustainable development goals uh, that could possibly be, you know, the roadmap or plan to 2050. And so I really like that we're getting the discussion on resilience and, and, and that multifaceted discipline and kind of having discussions on that. But with all this academics and, and action and experience that you have, has it helped you weather the pandemic and all this crazy, I have to say, shit that's been going on in our world just where, where sometimes we're just thinking we're going to tear out our hair and what's going on? Is this reality or not? And so um, I, I just want to know, has any of that helped you to weather this pandemic and come through it better? There so you go. you're back. It froze up for a minute. Yeah, you froze up for me. I don't know which 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 one of us was. So yes, thank you. Um, I, I think one of the things that um, so I've been working on climate and energy and sustainability my whole career. Um, so the past 20, 25 years or so. And my my training is, as you mentioned, is is in originally in the science and engineering at, with a very kind of technical lens. And what I found over the years is that we have been, um, you know, investing too much and putting too much emphasis on the technological innovation and not as much on the social innovation, right? Um, and, and the technology is essential and we need that. But what happens is that we've um, lost sight of the importance for understanding how our organizations work, how we're incentivized to do different things and, and what choices we have in, how, in our lifestyles and thinking about the social science, social innovation, social change aspects. And when we don't look at the social change aspects, we're actually also missing the social justice implications of our technologies and our policies. Um, and so that's kind of um, my own kind of frustration with how uh, the climate experts have been talking kind of mainstream about climate change has been that, that not connecting it with um, all kinds of issues that people wake up every day worrying about, like jobs and food and health and education and transportation and housing, right? Um, so, but you asked about the pandemic and this moment we're in, um, you know, we are in the intersecting crises that we're experiencing right now are really revealing the ineffectiveness of our policies and our leadership, right? Um, and it's across the board. We have here in the United States, we've had leadership not only denying the climate crisis, but denying the risks of the pandemic, denying that we have an economic crisis, denying that we actually, we had a healthcare crisis before the pandemic in, in terms of access to 
um, health healthcare. We have ha we have a housing crisis in the United States and in, in other parts of the world too. Um, and we have you know just the, so many intersecting crises um, that require us to reevaluate and restructure uh, because the, the it the syst our systems have not been working for so many people and that is being revealed right now. So um, I do have optimism in that um, there are so many creative and inspiring people and organizations around the world doing work that um, is building toward transformation. Um, and it is in times of disruption, like we're in right now, when opportunities for larger transformation are are evolve and emerge and i think and that's where my my optimism and and my commitment and passion for elevating these ideas now in the, in these moments of of disruption so you know you nicely uh gave us kind of this uh bigger picture of what's going on now and 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 um what we're seeing and what and, and the optimism that you have i want to poke and prod and drill a little bit deeper into, into your personal story first, if you don't mind. <clears throat> Has all that experience helped you to already build a sustainable infrastructure, resources to, to weather this time with that knowledge experience, what you're working on, what you're writing on? And then also, I, I imagine, because your book launched during all this craziness, right? So not only was it timely, but, um, to launch a book where everybody's in lockdown and there's not a lot of you know uh, stores or, or or whatever going on it, it's it's a little bit difficult i've had this come up with other people on the show that have also launched their book this year they're like oh it's a little bit different than normal you know those who have had books before so i, I kind of want to get just a little more insight on on what you've experienced um and the reason why, and I'm leading you, is obviously because um, once you've got your your infrastructure, your kind of resilience built up, or or you've been doing this and you've applied it into your own life, then it's a lot easier to spread that. And and for me, uh, uh, also speaking and doing a, a, a environment and energy and things over the years, what I've seen is that during this time the awareness, uh, a shift in awareness, a shift in action and movement, a lot more people approaching my, my projects have tripled. And so I, I'd also like to see for you if you have a similar experience. Yeah, no, thank you. So in terms of my, my um, personal experience during the, the pandemic and, and um, you know, I'm a professor in a, uni in a large university, I'm a tenured professor. Um, so I feel a privilege and a, and a responsibility to be speaking up and speaking out um, and speaking, you know, truth to power and not being complacent. I think um, too many of, of, of us have, have become complacent because it's really hard to call out um, some of the, the structural issues that we um, also benefit from, right? Uh, particularly in terms of, I mean, this across the board with, um, um, when you think about structural racism, when you think about the climate crisis, um, you know, some of us are in positions where we are, are doing okay, right? Or have done well and have been able to navigate um, and, and our, our own privilege has, um, has allowed that. Um, so I really, where I am now in my career, um, I, I, you know, I'm at a different place in terms of proving myself academically, right? And so the, this book that I wrote is a non-academic book. It's a, it's a call to action. It's, it's a, it's actually quite a radical book in a sense. And it's, um, um, and I, I it, it integrates some of my research and my, my own life experience. Um, but it's really elevating the stories of these inspiring creative leaders that are um, tackling and, and engaging on climate and energy issues in, in creative and innovative ways. Um, with regard to the timing of the book, um, I, I started writing this book last summer um, and I had uh, a plan to finish around February. Um, and I, I pretty much met that deadline and submitted the, the, the manuscript at the end of February, beginning of March, right when um, it was 
becoming clear that we are now entering into this pandemic. Um, and uh, I was able, I was fortunate, the timing worked out to some degree in that I had one more chance to review the manuscript um, in late March, early April. Um, so I was able to reread knowing that we are now in a pandemic and actually integrating some examples of leadership uh, that we've already seen in the pandemic. For example, uh, the women leaders uh, in country, the countries that are, several countries that have run by women have been the most effective in managing the pandemic. So I was able to um, add in some examples um, like that. And, and um, I, again, I felt that timing was, was helpful in that um, the, same, the book, the same structure of the book and all the same messages of the book held true before the pandemic, but being able to, um, you know, systematically and make sure that the pandemic was mentioned throughout the book actually makes it a lot more um, resonate with people because it, it acknowledges, you know, we do, we are in this place where pre pandemic versus post pandemic, I mean, during the pandemic, it's very different, like stark realities. Right. And so, so that was, that was helpful. Um, one of the other things um, in terms of, yeah, the book was officially published in September in the United States and um, just in November, just this earlier this last week in, in the rest of the world. Um, and I have, you mentioned, you know, the constraints in terms of travel and all of that, um, which is true. And the, the, the flip side is that I've been able to, um, you know, virtually travel to um, uh, Hong Kong, California, Indiana, um, you know, uh, yes, uh, Norway. Yes, I've seen you all over. I've seen you all over the internet and on, on videos, but also on podcasts. So that's fabulous. Yeah. So, so the virtual space, you know, is in some ways more efficient in terms of I don't have to get on a plane and and go to all these places in person. I mean, obviously you miss the, the connection and, and the informal uh, communication that's associated with meeting people in person and or signing books or anything like that. But, but um, again, at the same time, you know, there's new, new ways that we're all adapting and, and innovating in terms of um, communicating with each other and um, yeah, changing some of those expectations. And in some ways, that your, things are more accessible, right? If you have an internet connection, people can join all kinds of things. And, and um, so that's, that's been an interesting uh, part of, of, of what I've been doing in the past uh, couple of weeks and months. Yeah, that's fabulous. I'm, I'm sure there's probably some more digital formats and media that you've uh, developed. You know, I've seen a couple of your videos where you've presented the book in a kind of a slide presentation format, which is made it even more visual. I really, the chapter you were speaking about, I, I believe was chapter four, health, well-being and nutritious food for all, where you really touched a little bit more about the COVID. You kind of went into health and, and things a little bit. And there's uh, 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 probably a couple other little places that you you mentioned that as well, uh, as far as the pandemic is what you're, you're uh, discussing. So that was, that was a nice, very timely uh, uh, book. And then you just have the most wonderful publisher, you know, Island Press is uh, very much in our topics and kind of around these uh, supporting and, and super, uh, and I've, I've exchanged some emails with them as well. And so, so supportive, so helpful. I think you just, you, I, it hasn't affected you at all. You are ready to, to pivot and had, had everything there that uh, really went good. And I, I really want to say, well, I hope and congratulate you since you're in the U.S. in Boston um, of the hopeful outcome of, of uh, Biden Harris, but more so, wow, Kamala Harris. Uh, is, uh, and, and this kind of goes to my to my question as well: Is she part of the Grow Squad? Because that is a powerhouse right there. I'm so happy about that. Absolutely. So um, you know, having the first black woman on the ticket um, and the first woman um, in, um, in the White House um, 
is 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 huge and i think um you know some of the media in the united states has actually downplayed the significance of this um and i think um it's just really inspiring and um offers a lot of optimism and hope for opening up doors for so many people who have been historically excluded uh for so long um so Yes, there's a there's a lot of um, of optimism with with Kamala Harris and and also I mean with the Biden administration at at, at in general um, because there's really a hope that um, this administration will is is in a moment where all of these I mean the, as I mentioned the intersecting crises but then the um, multi-racial multi-generational coalitions of activism and advocacy that has really emerged um, in the past couple of years as a powerful force um, in the united states uh, and, and in other parts of the world too uh, but in particular the the mobilization of the youth in particular um, in the united states with the sunrise movement and i i mentioned in the book also Varshini Prakash, who's a co-founder and executive director of the Sunrise Movement, which is an organization that has really just uh, catalyzed and mobilized young people. And so many young people, you know, look to the future and are really not, uh, are really concerned, not only about the climate crisis, but about, you know, job prospects for the future, the way the world has been going um you know it's been really hard and i have two daughters myself who are 19 and 21 and i see them looking to the future and like it doesn't look so bright right and so the youth and this is where the really intergenerational justice is another piece of this right it's the older people who who have been resisting change and saying you know we have to keep it the way it is and um you know i think that's really been um a key piece and and that's where i think the Biden Kamala uh, administration really has 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 the potential to be um, uh, a real uh, ushering in bigger transfer structural change. Um, obviously, we do that isn't going to happen unless a lot of us are involved and engaged and pushing. And so it's not, you know, the congratulations is is uh, very tempered. Um, especially, obviously, since we still have um, the current occupant of the White House has not conceded. So we have multiple levels here of, of real dysfunction and, and challenges ahead. Um, but, but again, I, I, I am, there is reason for optimism. I agree, and, and you, you answer that so nice. I hope no, you, nobody's toes were stepped on, so very politically correct. So. Uh, but I'm damn happy and I, I hope it happens and um, that, that we really move in the right direction, especially, uh, you know, dialing back all the, all the rollbacks that Trump did and all the things that he stepped out of that we kind of step back in and not just take a little step back in that we actually double our efforts and, and hit that exponential curve towards meeting some of these agreements, Paris Agreement and and many other uh, the very important environmental things um, where um, diversity, biodiversity, where um, um, climate action and, and environmentalism really need to be at the number one top point of focus in, in, in our world or where we go. Yeah, as you so eloquently said, the book is, um, it's not an academic book, it's about leadership. And I, I loved it. I devoured it. It, it just spoke to me. Uh, uh, very succinct, uh, seven chapters, you know. Um, I, I want to go into that more and have you kind of dissect and, and um, that for our, our listeners. But it really talked about something that I've experienced over the years many times, this climate isol uh, isolationism. Um, and that we really need to move from that shift and more into this energy democracy into another, you know, transition. And then I tickled it a little bit with the growth squad and asking if uh, vice uh, hopeful uh, uh, vice president elect Kamala Harris 
is part of that. I think uh, whether she knew it or not, she's kind of in, in that category as well, as well as many others. Do you mind just kind of giving us a little um, your your pitch and rundown of the book and, and what led you to that? A little bit of a, a touched in your biography because your history and what you've wrote, written on before and where you've studied around uh, around the world and in the U.S. especially has also kind of led to your eyes opening of what we're doing wrong and where we need to go. Absolutely. So this idea of climate isolationism is um, the way, the ineffective way that for too long we've been talking about climate policy as kind of separate from everything else, right? Um, and and also kind of talked a lot about decarbonization and greenhouse gas emission reductions and kind of this technocratic way of thinking about the numbers associated with it, um, which you know is important and quantifying things is, is good and helpful, especially when you have goals and metrics. Um, but it also has inadvertently excluded people because people you know, don't wake up every day thinking about carbon emissions. And um, it's also uh, kind of been limiting in, the, in also this technocratic lens, thinking about, oh, we need technology to save us, right? And, and that has proven to be ineffective and insufficient and inadequate, basically. So what I propose is this um, alternative lens that we could be using of energy democracy, which is basically accepting the premise that we need to transition away from fossil fuels to a renewable based future. And looking at that transformation as an opportunity to invest in what people and communities and households need, right? Um, and it is revolutionary or really transformative because renewable energy is a totally different thing than extractive fossil fuels. So when we talk about a renewable renewable based future, we're talking about, um, you know, it's not all one one technology either, right? There could be multiple um, scales, multiple different kinds of technologies. So solar and wind are obviously key. But on in coastal communities, we could also have wave and tidal energy and offshore wind. Inland communities, we could have solar and wind at different scales from household to like mega projects. But we can also have geothermal energy, which is a technology that we have under invested in. And there are, when you think about the breadth of different renewable um, technologies and, and resources, every community in the world actually has access to renewable energy. So it that's why it is so um, revolutionary because that once you've, figured out a way to harness that renewable resource, the energy is plentiful, plentiful abundant, and free, ultimately. Um, so you really can redistribute power, literally and figuratively, and take back the concentration of wealth and power from the fossil fuel industry, which has really been um, in, in many countries around the world, but in the United States in particular, it has been devastating. The, the concentration of wealth and power by fossil fuel interests have led us to policies across the board that are not in the public interest, not elevating and optimizing the public good. And we have seen um, a widening income and wealth gap in the United States, which is just economic injustice is just being perpetuated. And it is continuing even during this pandemic, the billionaires are getting richer and richer and everyone else is really, really struggling and suffering. So what um, the premise, one of the premises of that I talk about in the book is this idea of the polluter elite, which includes um, Coke industries and other fossil fuel interest shareholders and executives and other wealthy individuals and organiza organizations that are profiting from fossil fuels and perpetuating fossil fuels. Though the polluter elite has for decades been strategically investing to resist the renewable energy transformation. So we have the technologies, we know we could we could have done it by now, but we haven't because they want to continue to make money off of the fossil fuel, um, our fossil fuel reliance. And the way they've been investing in that 
is they um, had a very strategic misinformation campaign to deny climate science and confuse us about the dangers of burning fossil fuels and about the dangers of the risks of climate, the climate crisis. They've also been investing to undermine public trust in government and dismantle regulations that are designed to help and protect us and protect our health. Um, and they've been minimizing worker protections and worker rights, right? And this has all been very kind of behind the scenes. A lot of people haven't realized that this has been going on, but it's been going on for decades. And that's one of the reasons why we are where we are right now, which I, is a very difficult position. I totally agree. And I'm so glad that you brought up that before you move on to the girl squad, I, I kind of um, uh, grow the squad area. I want to kind of touch on a few things that you said and, and make that clear. So originally when you're talking about this transformation, climate isolationism to energy democracy, what you're talking about is the basic needs of humanity. So Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the bottom layers of that pyramid, so to say, uh, breathing food, water, energy, uh, uh, security of resources, security of body, that, that we change the system that's not owned by a patriarchal democracy. Uh, it's the, uh, 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 that's kind of done by a very diverse democracy, one that is uh, not only renewable, but one that's for all covering the basic needs. And, and yes, you have a little focus on the U.S., but it's really a global thing that you're seeing and discussing as well, which I absolutely love because that is, you know, I'm an advocate for the sustainable development goals. And it's really about a global plan for the future. It's about bringing everybody out of poverty and hunger and giving them the resources, the infrastructure. That's what this nice sustainable development is. It's, an, it's a solid infrastructure for the future for us to springboard off into resilience, which, which you also work on as well. And so I love that, that, you, that you touched upon that as, as well. And, and that most of these, uh, these monopolies or these uh, patriarchal structures that are, are dominating, manipulating and doing some very crazy things are, are very similar to back in the, with the tobacco industry, how they kind of use some weird uh, means through lobbyists and, uh, and other measures to kind of pull the wool over humanity's eyes and, and things. And that that's also very male run, very patriarchal. It's, it's just a small few um, that is, it's not for everybody. It's not looking out for the big picture for us all. And so I really love that you touch upon that, but you have, you really go into the depth of kind of dissecting that a little bit and then addressing the gaps and, and helping us to understand that. Um, and, and I don't know if now you're gonna kind of go into to grow the squad and, and how, that, how that moves, but I really want you to because um, I eventually want you to, to, after you've explained it a little bit better to us, kind of help my listeners understand why the empowerment of women and girls after, after you've talked about the wonderful female leadership and, and the direction, what that brings to our world and how this uh, Grow the Squad goes, that we really get into that as well and, uh, and discuss that because I mentioned that a lot as well in a lot of my talks and, my, and, and books and, and things that I'd like to come out today. Yeah, so yeah, chapter one of the book is called Growing the Squad. Um, and the squad are, are these four junior Congresswomen um, who came on the national stage in the United States uh, two years ago um, and really changed the national discourse on climate and energy by explicitly connecting um, climate and energy with jobs and economic justice, with racial justice, with health, and with housing and the need for public housing, investments in public housing in the United States. Um, so these young women, they're all women of color uh, from four different states. Ayanna Presley is the my representative here in Massachusetts. She's the first black woman to represent Massachusetts um, in, in uh, the national government. Um, and what they have demonstrated is that the principles of anti-racist feminist leadership are key, right? Because what they have done is um, demonstrate how we can be more inclusive and collaborative and participatory 
And when um, we center social justice at the core of all of our policies, we come up with very different policies, right? Um, and they are really focused on uh, calling out the patriarch patriarchal leadership that is really based on domination and exclusion, intentionally excluding people to further concentrate their own wealth and power and hold on to um, uh, the, the power that they have. And when, when we do that, when they do that, they're actually exacerbating inequities and uh, racial and gender disparities. And the only way they're, they've been effective is by denying problems, right? So they deny the systemic problems to kind of sustain the status quo. So they deny the climate crisis, they deny we have structural racism, they deny the economic crisis, health crisis, uh, food and housing crisis. Um, but what the, the squad, and the squad is also very inclusive. It's not just those four women. Um, Ayanna Presley likes to say that anyone who centers social justice at the core um, is, can, be, can join the squad, is a member of the squad, right? So, um, but the squad is really focused on reducing inequities and disparities by centering social justice, racial justice, and economic justice at the center, at the core of every policy and process that we that we have. Because if we're not centering it, we are actually inadvertently perpetuating and exacerbating those inequities. So the other um, piece here is that um, anti-racist feminist leadership, when you embrace the world with that lens, you're also able to see how the link leverage uh, the transformation that's necessary by linking problems together, not by thinking about each of these challenges separately. And, and I think that's that's really key. One thing that I wanna um, emphasize with uh, the, the title of the book, Diversifying Power, um, Why We Need Anti-Racist Feminist uh, Leadership on Climate and Energy. When I talk about anti-racist feminist leadership, everybody, anybody, regardless of your gender, your race, your religion, your cultural background can embrace anti-racist feminist leadership or principles. All that means is that you acknowledge the structural inequities and you are committed to um, reducing those and acknowledging them and centering social justice at the core. Um, but so anyone can embrace anti-racist feminist uh, principles. The other piece that is really important, and this gets to the second part of your of your of your question, is that representation also really matters. It's when women, people of color, and indigenous folks are um, come to the table in leadership spaces where they've been historically excluded. Um, we actually bring different life experiences. We bring different perceptions of risk. Um, because of these structural issues that we have experienced in our own lives. And therefore, we bring a different capacity to center social justice at the core of our policies. Um, and so that is why representation is so important. And um, as well as uh, mobilizing and inspiring other young people to, um, to uh, get involved and feel agency and, and um, you know, leverage the collective power that we all have. Um, but it's really important that, that we have uh, diversity at the table so that we can develop the most effective and policies that consider all of the complexities um, and all of the different constituents and different communities that need to be uh, considered um, and that have been for too long not considered, right? Either invisible or um, or even intentionally excluded, right? And and so that's really a, a key point of of the whole book. I I don't want to get too controversial or be too big of a devil's advocate, but I want to ask you a question that kind of comes up uh, to me. Um, I really think that in, in all things in, in our world, there's really this balance, you know, the yin and yang, the good and the bad, the, the, the um, ways. And so I, I really only usually focus on the real positive people, the ones that we've discussed here today, the, the ones in your book that are really helping uh, diversify, helping uh, the feminist movement, helping uh, uh, 
empower women and girls. But I believe there's a few bad actors in there that are actually doing as much damage as well in, in the process. And um, um, I don't even, I, I'm, I'm not sure, is, do you ever say, well, like maybe Sarah Palin or, or uh, um, um, Conway from Trump, you know, that they maybe might be doing more to harm uh, good democracy or good diplomacy by uh, jumping on the support of, of uh, you know, these wrong patriarchals and they're just there to, to fill a spot, but they're not helping any movement. Do you ever discuss or talk about uh, uh, that at all? Absolutely. So this is where it's also really important to focus on the anti-racist feminist principles, right? Not all women are feminists or not all women um, necessarily understand understand and are focusing social justice and uh, gender equity in their actions, right? And, and um, so, so I think that is a critical, um, that's why both of these, these, I, these ideas are so critical that we wanna be elevating anti-racist feminist leadership, which can be embraced by anybody. And, and we want representation so that we can better center social justice and it's there are examples as you mentioned um, of people who might represent but they don't embrace the principles and vice versa there might be there are many people including many white women white men who embrace the principles but they don't help with the representation right so yeah, yeah. so th i think that's why um both threads are really important and it's and um and it's, you know, it's not a universal thing that all women or all black people um, embrace a certain um, perspective, right? We're all part of these complex social networks and, the, and we're influenced by and we're getting um, incentivized to think certain ways about certain things. And so um, that's where I think, yeah, uh, always elevating both of those threads is, is important when we talk about diversity. So in your book, you talk about some uh, some wonderful uh, wonderful uh, um, advocates, activists, uh, women who are really doing some fabulous things. Um, uh, you've touched upon, you know, Representative Alexandria Cortez, uh, Gina McCarthy, uh, Mc, uh, uh, McLean, who is the Citizens for Environmental Justice. Uh, Julian Hishaw of Farms, uh, who I really like because I do a lot with food, Representative Omar, and um, and it, it is for me, I mean, the, there's many, many more. So, I mean, just we're just tickling the surface. This is a, a, a big thing. And uh, there's also a lot of data, um, so to say, from the actions from those women who have, have shown or been in those positions and have done some actions and rallied people and made some changes and impacts that we're seeing that there's so much success uh, uh, of so much better future, so much positiveness that comes out of those things that they do. And um, that's where, why I really, you know, at this point in time, my listeners need to get out there. They need to go to Island Press. They need to get your book. They need to read it. They need to think about how they can be become active. I, I uh, mention a lot, you know, the, 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 the two biggest ways to draw down our global warming and, and fix ecological and environmental problems. And, and even more importantly, human health and human uh, reduce human suffering is to empower women and girls. Um, I've gotten questions in the past. Mark, you said empowering women and girls. What does that mean? And, and, and well, how, how, how can you say that? What, what does that have to do with anything? Can you give us some tools, tips, tricks, or maybe some, some wisdom to tell us how that ties together and how um, people should look at seeing that besides the, the diversification and, and, and besides some of the things that you touch on in the book, maybe some even more um, because it, there's numerous, it's not just a couple things, it's numerous things that impact it. Yeah, so I think the answer, or you know, one way to, to think about that is just acknowledging um, how 
Um, we all, again, bring our different life experiences and bring creativity and innovation um, when we have diversity. So um, when we think about inspiring women and girls to uh, be leaders in whatever domain, right, that they um, are passionate about, we, we recognize and you can see with all kinds of evidence how um, that results in um, you know stronger communities, stronger organizations, stronger uh, policies and processes, and and so it, I mean it's it's directly connected to the 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 previous argument that I was that I was making that I've been making, um, and I think it's really important to acknowledge that with the different life experiences and and perceptions of risk is actually another key thing. You know, there's research that shows that um, white men think of everything as less risky than do uh, women or non-white men uh, in the United States, at least. And and that speaks to kind of um, you know our our experiences with vulnerability and risk perceptions. And when people um, uh, elevate the lives and insights and experiences and, and priorities that a, a greater diversity of people, um, including women and girls and, and others, um, when those voices are included, we end up with um, you know, more robust discourse, more robust solutions to problems, more robust and effective approaches to, um, and as I mentioned, stronger communities and organizations. And, and so again, the research on diversity um, is, is consistent in, you know, organizations with more women on boards, countries in the world that have more women in leadership positions actually have stronger climate ambitions and policies. Um, and so it's, it's, there's a collective good that obviously it's good for the women and the girls to have choices and have agency and, and have more fulfilling or different opportunities. Um, but it's also bigger than that, right? It's actually better for, for society to have more, more different voices. And, and I think that's where, um, again, the creativity of the leaders that I highlight in the book and the innovation um, of how people are thinking about these the different ideas and the intersections is 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 so so powerful. But back to your point about um, particularly like the climate and drawdown and like the you know is it how why is it that women and girls educating women and girls is is such a uh, leverage point right and such a powerful uh, area to focus in. Um, is because of these multiple win-win right outcomes of when women and girls have have education, then they have opportunities, then they have uh, agency and can get involved and have the freedom to get involved in contributing to helping societies different problems that are and 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 it ends up oftentimes and research shows that when women and girls have more choices they will end up having fewer children, right? Um, and that is, is a, a key piece as well because um, that contributes in, in, a, in, a, in a different way to our, our resource use and the overall um, impact of, of humanity on, on the planet. So, so it's all connected in that sense. Um, and I focus more on, well, again, the, I, I like to focus on all the innovation that comes by being more inclusive and as, as kind of a really key key point that people don't always um, recognize how good it is, how better it is for all of us, right? I, I appreciate you letting me put you on the spot and, and, and thank you for answering that. that uh, that's wonderful. You, you, you did it so eloquently. Um, I always find it's uh, sometimes not, it's not taken the same way when, when I say it or when I try to explain it just who I am so uh, um, uh, it's kind of like you know 
I'm saying almost the same things as Greta or some of these other youth leaders, but I don't have the innocence or they don't like my beard or that, you know, I'm a, a grandpa, whatever. And so they just, the message doesn't get heard. So I really appreciated you bringing that down. I, I want to get kind of into, yeah, it's a, cu a couple other questions and then we'll come back to more resilience and, and a little bit more of the book. Um, do you feel like you're a global citizen and how would you feel in a world without nations, borders and divisions of humanity with nationalism, with the, the, without staunch racism and things that we've seen really bubbling and under the microscope during this pandemic? Yeah, great question. I, um, you know, the, the constraints of our national s structures of countries, um, are are very real, and you know we can see it now with the um, with the pandemic, and also with the climate crisis. You know when we try our collective efforts, we are um, yeah constrained by our 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 nationalism and our national politics and and all of that. Um, I actually w I was born in Dublin, Ireland, and my so I actually am a EU citizen. And my family moved to the United States uh, when I was eight. Um, so I, I do have dual citizenship, um, uh, EU and the United States. And um, so I, I definitely feel uh, uh, to be a you know a global citizen. Um, and I I think you know this is where solidarity across countries and social movements uh, where we can connect outside the constraints of our national borders um, is so powerful. Um, and with all of these issues that are so universally challenging, right? Um, I think there's there's a lot of potential for us to, um, you know, I don't think get rid of our national borders, but, it, but for us to, um, you know, connect and and network beyond our our borders and and really, um, and I have I mean I have a lot of international and global collaborations and friends and family and and advocacy networks that I'm a part of and um, you know it's so fulfilling and inspiring right to be able to connect with people around the world who are resonating with some of your struggles in a very different context, but the same struggle, right? And it's very powerful. And so, yes, it's a great question. And, and I, I, I encourage all of us to, you know, reach out across our, our national um, borders and, and, and connect as we can. I mean, obviously there's only so many hours in the day, right? And many of us have our activism uh, more locally or nationally. I mean, there's so many scales and levels that we can engage. Um, so we do need to be intentional about that, about where we're putting most of our energy. Um, but I do, and I think the global and international uh, networks are are increasingly important, um, especially as we see, you know, the rise of authoritarianism in so many countries, and and really failures of of, of uh, participatory uh, governance structures. Thank you very much. So um, uh, we, we probably need to do another podcast eventually because um, your your strong ties to energy and being in this for such a long time. Um, for me, uh, the, the basic energy need for human beings, uh, physiological needs are breathing, food, and water. So you know, human health, food you know, where that food comes from, our soils and things. And that's why my book, uh, Menu B, is being on food. And so I'd love to kind of maybe another time dive deeply into, into that and, and, and uh, dissect that. And, uh, and that's why chapter four of your book was so wonderful to me because it touched on, on that spectrum as well. Um, my, my hardest question for you today, and then you can... Uh, uh, have a sigh of relief and relax a little bit. It's the burning question, WTF, and it's not the swear word, although many of us have been pulling out our hair saying the swear word this, this year. It's uh, what's the future? Yeah, so I've actually studied how big societal transformation happens. Um, and when 
in order to have big transitions. Um, it, the theory is, the academic theory is that you need disruptions and disruptions at multiple levels. So you need the status quo to be disrupted, which is where we are right now, I think, because of the pandemic, as well as some other factors. But our day-to-day -day normal, right, has been definitely disrupted. And I think everyone can feel that. Um, then you need some macro level disruptions um, that could be the climate crisis, um, right? We're seeing more frequent and intense climate disruptions of all kinds and, and, and the implications of that. And then at the same time, you need local level, innovative niche experimentation, a grassroots activism. Um, and I see that as well. So, um, you know, I, I I am um, optimistic about a, a restructuring and a transformation of, of society. I know it may seem naive uh, given what's going on, um, but I think there are enough of us who are committed and passionate and creative and innovative, and we are networked and we can be increasingly networked with each other and support each other. Um, and, and again, in, we see these um, amazing leaders who are in political office, um, who are speaking truth to power and changing the discourse. And yes, they're getting vilified and uh, particularly um, the squad, the, the women I mentioned, they have been targets of horrible misogyny and racist attacks and, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard work um, and it's very challenging environment to um, do this work. Um, but we, we need to continue and, and I mean, there's the alternatives are, you know, there's no, you know, we gotta, gotta keep uh, a, a positive vision for the future and, and continue to work toward that. So, so obviously no one can predict the future and um, we, we are in a, such a time of suffering and hardship throughout the world right now. Um, and so how it's all going to play out is, is difficult to predict, but I do think there needs to be, um, you know, it's part of the pandemic kind of recovery phase of hum humanity. Um, we can position ourselves to be making big public investments in what people, families, communities, households need. Um, and what we need to make sure is that those investments are made in a way that um, prioritize the needs of the people who've been underinvested in for too long and don't end up you know, giving handouts to the already uh, wealthy people who, who will continue to concentrate their wealth and power, right? So we, that's where, again, why the, the message of diversification and centering social justice at the core of all of our, as many leaders as we can, right, in every aspect is so important so that in the post-pandemic recovery, um, if and when we get to that phase, we will uh, be able to leverage our collective um, wisdom and the resources that the, the world has to elevate um, for a more prosperous and sustainable future for all. Now that's so beautiful. <laughs> wow. So uh, there, there's no, that's the right answer. Ding, 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 you won. Uh, um, but the, everybody that I ask that question is, it's always different, but I really like how you um, so nicely put that. And, and, and that's, I'm just gonna let it sit because it's actually really wonderful. You teach um, energy, democracy, and climate resilience, uh, technology policy, and social change uh, um, at the university, or you have in the past. And um, for me, I told you I started in 2019 with Resilience Frontiers, which, which could be the, the next goals after the Sustainable Development Goals, or um, possibly spark some other discussions uh, similar to how the SDGs were developed. Um, Resilience is really, you know, there's different types of resilience. There's the dystopian resilience where we're wearing spacesuits and gas masks. And, and there's the resilience of emotions and body where, you know, if somebody swears or hits you, um, which I'm sure uh, uh, 
in your book, and but also the, the, those of the the squad are dealing with quite a bit. You know, how do you bounce back with some resilience uh, on these crazies or or what's happening? And then there's you know this uh, re, um, resilient, desirable futures or climate resilient, something where um, tomorrow a hurricane, a, a flood, a drought, or something hits us, but we still have the resilience to bounce back the next day with energy, with food, water, and many other things. And I'm sure you have a much deeper breadth of knowledge in resilience, but I was wondering if you could kind of maybe depart some wisdoms that you've learned over, over the years in resilience. And, and um, you know, for years, we've been talking sustainability, sustainability, be sustainable. And a lot of people don't, they're sick of it. They don't understand it. It's too much for them. But also what they uh, don't realize is that you can be the most sustainable country or place in the world. And the very next day, a hurricane can hit you and all your sustainability is wiped out. But the next day you need food, energy, water, infrastructure. Uh, and, and so uh, uh, in some respects, we don't wanna negate sustainability, but what, res what I understand is if you have resilience, it automatically has sustainability or should have sustainability ingrained in the resilience, but it also allows you to thrive or flourish or to have resources, basic resources and, and hopefully others uh, the very next day. And so I would love to, to, to steal a little bit of your wisdom and get some insight on, on what you teach and what you, you know in that respect. Yeah, no, thank you. It's a great question. And I've thought a lot about sustainability and resilience and using those words in different contexts and some overlap. And as you mentioned, some, some distinctions for sure. My, my own definition or the way I think about um, resilience, and I think this can apply to all the different scales and levels of types of resilience that you mentioned, is really preparing for, adapting to, and then learning from disruptions of all kinds, right? And that could be at the individual level, something bad in your life happens, and you have to like adapt. You want to be prepared for it, you want to adapt to it, and then you want to learn from it so that you can continue on in, and hopefully in a stronger way. Um, but that also resonates with kind of community resilience and climate resilience. Like we know um, that we are gonna have more frequent and intense climate disruptions of all kinds, whether it be floods, droughts, um, hurricanes and typhoons, um, uh, extreme weather, um, you know, the, the wildfires, um, sea level rise, um, all of these, things. So we, we, we need to be preparing, adapting, and then learning from each. Um, we are, we, we're past the point of prevention, right? We are not going to be able to prevent all of the, the climate disruptions because we're already experiencing them and it, they're just going to continue to accelerate and, and become more um, disruptive. So um, that's where the investments in acknowledging and the preparing and adapt adaptation is so important right and and that's been difficult to um uh mobilize people right to to invest pro preventively for these inevitable but still you know futuristic um uh disruptions that we know are coming but we kind of hope well they haven't come yet so maybe we're okay kind of thing um, the other thing that I um, am, am particularly, again, centering social justice when we talk about resilience is key because so in too many instances, um, a lot of our resilience strategies um, have been end up helping the wealthier people. Like if you have a big flood or hurricane in many communities, the well-off households have insurance, they get the money, they can build back, maybe they even build back a nicer house at the end, right? Whereas the lower income households are really screwed, right? Their, their house is gone. They may not have insurance. They may, may be forced to move, you know, homeless and then have to like cobble together a new life somewhere, right? And, and so each disruption can exacerbate and perpetuate inequities unless we intentionally design our resilient strategies and policies and processes to, again, focus and center on the people who need the help the most. And, and I think that has been 
that isn't always doesn't always come to the fore in our resilience discussions, but it's so critical. Um, so that's where I try to have an impact in the dis the, the general discourse um, about resilience, about really thinking about the distributional impacts of climate and other disruptions, um, and then integrating the, our knowledge and understanding about the inequities and disparities in how we prioritize our um, policies and investments to strengthen our resilience. Thank you for sharing that wisdom with us and, and making it clear because people hear me speak about resilience quite a bit in there. The, they, they need to hear another voice. They need to be a little bit um, made aware of, of, of what it is, how to look at it, how to understand it. Um, and, and that was so beautiful. You, you mentioned adapt a lot in, in, in what you said. So I told you uh, the Alohas Resilience uh, Foundation. And so Aloha stands for Adaptive Lifestyle of Health and Sustainability. So it's an acronym. But even it, more interesting, I told you about Resilience Frontiers, which was in Songdo, Korea last uh, February 2019. That was at the National Adaptation Planning Expo in Songdo, Korea, which the UN has every, every year. Uh, that was hosted by Ban Ki-moon, and we did this uh, Resilience uh, Frontiers um, kind of a moonshot workshop thinking about what's the future beyond 2030. So uh, <clears throat> it, it's real nice to hear, you know, adapt, adaptation, and how that plays into resilience and why we need to be thinking about those type of things. And it's really uh, planning for the future, making sure you have this resilience and, and, and that, it's, that it's, well, um, it's well spread or it's well uh, placed, that not just to the top who can have insurance, but that it's equal for all, that it's really even, it evenly dis, uh, dispersed or displaced for everyone around the world so that we can have it because we are on one spaceship Earth. I, I'm going to wrap up. I have three more vital questions for you. Uh, um, and then if there's anything else that you missed that you would like to say, we'll, I'll, I'll let you uh, let us know that. But uh, it's kind of a selfish thing. It's for my listeners and it's a sustainable takeaway for them that they could apply and make their life better. Some wisdoms from you. If there was one message you could depart to my listeners that was really a sustainable takeaway that had, has the power to change their life, what would it be, basically, your message? Um, I think we all should be advocating for systems change and, and bigger, focusing on systems. I mean, each, our individual choices are important and part of, we're all part of the system, but I do think we're at a point where we need larger transformation and, and for that we have to be advocating for restructuring and, 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 and really focusing on broader uh, systemic structural changes. I love it. We could go to a whole nother two hour show just on systems view of life, systems approach, as I speak about that all the time. Um, what should young innovators in your field be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make a real big impact? I think um, leveraging our collective power, right? We are all leaders. When we talk about leadership, it's not just uh, those in elected positions. Um, we're all leaders in our communities, in our organizations, in our families, in our um, uh, different networks that we're in. So I think um, really stepping up and and speaking up, speaking out, and and leading to act other and acting to inspire others to lead um, is really important. And it's so much easier when you're part of a collective. Um, and, and so I think that's, that's key. I love it. What have you experienced or learned in this long professional journey that you've had so far that you wish or would have loved to know from the beginning? Well, I guess I, you know, at the beginning of my journey, I didn't understand these power dynamics um, of gender and race and the structural uh, systems that kind of are so pervasive in so many areas. So I think revealing that is, 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 is so powerful. And I think that's where, again, I'm so inspired because so many young people I know 
see it and recognize it way earlier in their lives, right? So um, I think that's that's really that's I think that's where I feel like I've I'm late to the game in a sense. But here wish, I am. Yeah, you wish you would have known earlier. You would have started or changed or been discussing it more. Uh, it's uh, yeah. such such an important topic. Um, that's it. That's all I have for you today. And I really, really appreciate all your time. If there's anything you'd like to ask me or anything we didn't get a touch upon that you'd like to address before I say goodbye, now's your chance. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Mark. It's a great conversation. And um, I guess just to listeners, um, you know, if you're interested in more of my work or if you want to connect, um, I can be, I have a website, uh, JennyCStevens.com, and I'm also on Twitter at JennyCStevens. So, um, you know, spreading the networking is great. And I also just mentioned the book, um, all author proceeds from the book go to NAACP's Environmental and Climate Justice Program, which is an amazing program that is uh, elevating the strategic manipulation from fossil fuel interests, particularly in black communities in the United States. So it's, it's a really important work and I'm, I'm, they're also featured in the, in the book and um, the proceeds, author proceeds of the book go directly to them. So. I will do some nice time stamping in the descriptions and also put in um, your websites and your Twitter and, and that as well. And so I, I Truly, I recommend everybody get your book um, and uh, start to shift their perspective. Let's diversify and and and, and empower uh, women, and let's 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 get rid of this anti-racism and, and all, and just move forward. Thank you so great. much. I really appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you, Mark. Bye bye.